lawyers who have represented a murderer or serial killer, what was it like? My dad was a lawyer and represented several murderers. One of the more interesting anecdotes is from my mom. When I was about two, my dad hires an old client of his to babysit me. She's an older lady who watches me a few times. Later, my mom discovered she was charged with the murder of her husband, ended up convicted of manslaughter, and was out after a few years. Mom gave my dad a lot of hell for allowing a murderer to babysit. His response? Well, it's not like Curious Pursuit is going to cheat on her. I have defended four people charged with murder in their trials. All four were found guilty. One very likely did it, but there may have been mitigating circumstances we were not allowed to introduce at trial. One probably did it, but I'm not sure he had the required intent to be found guilty of murder. One certainly did it, but I truly believe at the time he was insane. The last one is the one that I still think about sometimes in the middle of the night. No physical evidence, no confession, no weapon. He was still found guilty, but I have my doubts. I've represented three murderers, but not in the criminal cases. Two of these cases were where the murderer was sued by the family members of the person they killed. The insurance companies denied a defense because intentional acts are almost always excluded from insurance policies, and the family of the murderer hired my firm to try to obtain insurance coverage. I never met the criminals, and we were able to successfully resolve the matter so that the families received some compensation. We do this all the time in civil cases, usually by us coaching their attorney how to properly plead the case to make the insurer responsible for having to pay for a defense, and then the insurer decides that it is cheaper to settle than it is to defend. The third time, he had committed murder as a young man. Really, it was a bar fight that went too far. Was convicted of second degree murder, sentenced to 20 to life, was a model prisoner, paroled after 14 years, did his time, and had started a successful business as a real estate developer. Then in 2006, he was driving his truck, blew a tire, and veered into traffic, causing a significant crash. He hired us to sue his insurer when the insurer denied coverage. I didn't know until I was prepping him for his deposition that he had been a murderer, and I never would have guessed it in the first place. Fortunately, that didn't come out when he was deposed. We were able to recover a significant amount of money, mid seven figures for him, which he used to pay the people who he hurt when his tire blew out. Absolutely the nicest guy you could imagine. A decade later, he still pops into the office and brings us donuts occasionally. My father has been a criminal defense attorney for 30 plus years. He no longer takes those types of cases, homicide, serial murder, etc., because they do take an enormous toll on your mental well-being. My father is as calloused and confident as they make him, so if he is willing to admit that it rattles even his conscience, then it must be some serious shit. Apparently, during one of his first cases back in his 20s, he had to represent a murderer who he believed to be 100% guilty, could not go to sleep the night before trial, stayed up vomiting and crying all night long. I never represented a serial killer that I know of, but I represented quite a few murderers, and the answer is they're much like the rest of us. There is no mark of Cain. Some of them have explosive tempers, but under US laws, that tends to mitigate the offense by negating premeditation. The rest were just swept away by alcohol, drugs, jealousy, narcissism, a lot of that, and other unpleasant personality traits that most people will exhibit from time to time. Everybody gets angry. This common humanity means it's possible, indeed incumbent, on any criminal lawyer to develop good sentencing advocacy skills, meaning trying to find the best in people, then trying to make that core humanity clear to the court. Murderers need this most of all, regardless of whether the lawyer gets shit for arguing that murderer was a poor, abused child. Fuck it, they often were poor and abused, and it's your duty to make use of that evidence. Just a regular murderer, not a serial killer. It was fine. Here's the thing. You get into criminal defense law, you have to get used to the idea that you're going to be defending criminals. The criminal justice system isn't full of innocent people being railroaded and waiting for Matlock to show up and trap the star witness into admitting that she's really the killer. A really tiny number are factually innocent. A decent number did exactly what the police say they did. In the latter case, you're putting the crown to its proof, testing the evidence, testing the chain of custody or the witness's recollection or whatever looking not for a smoking gun of innocence, 
but for a reasonable doubt. You're trying to get the best outcome possible for them, which might be a not guilty verdict, but might be a conviction or a guilty plea on a lesser included charge. You do your best for everyone, right up to the limits of the law and the code of conduct. If you can't do your best because you're conflicted about representing criminals, then shocker, criminal law might not be for you. My only murderer was convicted of manslaughter. It was a fair outcome. I helped represent three murderers, all on death row, one at trial, and all three in post-conviction relief situations. They were interesting. I worked for one of the top death row defense attorneys in the nation. All of these men had mental health issues, which their original attorneys failed to explore and use as either a defense or as mitigation at sentencing. While I didn't feel any sympathy for what they did, including a 6 foot 7, 270 pound dude who looked like an NFL tight end or linebacker who brutally murdered an old lady with a screwdriver over a $200 social security check. It was sad to see how their original lawyers had failed to adequately protect their rights. At the end of the day, it's all the same whether I'm representing a dumb college kid in municipal court who got too drunk at the bar and started a fight with a bouncer, or someone accused of murder. Lawyer here. I was a public defender for about five years, now private practice because I make ten times as much. I'm going to speak more generally because a lot of homicide cases are just not that interesting. Half the time the defendant brags about how this is what happens when you fuck with me and thinks that doesn't implicate him, he confesses, or there's overwhelming evidence. I have no moral qualms about defense, it's important and the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to counsel. Some have said that the reason it's important that defendants have access to counsel because it makes sure any convictions stick. I find that line of reasoning utter bullshit. The reason I work in criminal defense is twofold. One, it is, quite literally, the only way the system works. The system will become corrupt with no criminal defense. Two, the system is completely biased against the defendants. Without counsel, they will be completely chewed up and spit out, and their punishment will extend far beyond the magnitude of the crime they may have actually committed. One example of how the system is biased against the defendants can be seen in overcharging. You have no idea how common overcharging is. When I was a public defender, it happened about 99% of the time. The state would overcharge just so they have an extra tool to use during plea negotiations, and they usually got away with it because most public defenders are overworked. Another example of this systematic bias is that prosecution doesn't always play by the rules, and you need someone on the defense to call them out on it. I was once defending a young gentleman who had a long list of charges. He'd been in and out of the justice system his entire life, and most recently, at the time, he had allegedly broke into several vehicles, stole the radios, and assaulted one vehicle owner that caught him. The prosecution called a community member that lived near him to the stand, a community member that had no standing to testify, and they would have gotten away with it if it weren't for me. They're sneaky, and obviously he didn't know that. They didn't have standing to testify. I guess that doesn't answer your question. The TL, doctor, is I have no moral qualms about it, but all my murderer or serial killer cases have been boring, and none have been high profile. I left the job before I qualified for the state's murder list, but I stumbled onto a murder case through a client who was out on bail for a non-violent drug offense. Thus, for about three weeks, I did technically represent somebody who was going to be charged with murder, even though I didn't get assigned to the murder case once it was put together. The short and legal to disclose version is this. It was sad, just sad. The facts of the case were sad, and not in the oh no, somebody died kind of way, but in the Christ, this is just a bunch of drugged out losers with a broken handgun and somebody ended up dead, possibly even by accident, kind of way. My client was just one of said sad drugged out losers. He wasn't on the business end of that broken handgun when it went off though, so he had that going for him, which was nice. Everything about his life was sad. Everything about my attorney-client relationship up until that point was sad. Inability to contact or find him, followed by a string of phone calls to my home phone, which I never gave out during office hours, with no name or contact info attached. I had to infer it was him by his voice. There were always exceptions, of course, but most of the time, one-on-one -on -one murder is a sad, poor-person crime. Even the hardest clients are caught up in a situation that most educated professionals, like say attorneys, recognize as the farcical churning of desperate fish in a small dirty ponds, where calling one of them big 
might as well be an insult for how meaningless and damning it is. In those rare instances, when you get a client who's a genuine shark, a horrifying, vicious, unrelenting predator, it's difficult to ignore the fact. But for a set of wealthy parents, he'd be out on a multi-decade legalized crime spree, wearing a nice suit, and spreading the suffering around far and wide with a nice set of prescriptions for his drugs and enough money to sweep a few aggrieved partners, sexual or otherwise, under the rug. A family friend of ours, her brother represented a very notable American mobster from the 70s. When my parents spoke to her about it, she had said she herself was worried, but he wasn't. The thing with this mobster was that it was already known he killed the people he did and was on the run. They weren't trying to prove his innocence, and at that point this man had made some choice decisions with law enforcement that really hurt his reputation with any surviving members of his gang. So the trial itself was very cut and dry, mostly about helping his sentence, making sure he wasn't going to be put into any random federal prison. He had specific needs relevant to the decisions he made with the law, and he would not be safe if he was put into any prison, and he was. I doubt it was very exciting beyond the media presence, trying to keep names on the down low to prevent giving out private information, but I'm sure a lot of you guys will be able to figure out who this man was. I work in child welfare, and when I was a CPS caseworker, I removed a child from a murderer. Got a call from law enforcement, showed up at the family home, law enforcement everywhere. They had literally just arrested this woman for murder, and she was in the cop car while I was talking to the sheriff and helping the six-year-old put a bag of his belongings together. Met with her at the county jail, floor-to-ceiling plexiglass between us, her in full shackles, where she was bawling and saying things like, I can't believe they have me locked up in here like some kind of killer, and whatnot. Shortly after, I saw her again in juvenile court. As the caseworker, I have a front row seat in the courtroom, and she was directly in front of me. During a pre-hearing conference, she turned around to participate in the discussion and our knees were literally about six inches apart. The rage in her eyes. Seriously, all I could see was her lunging at me, biting my juggler to kill me. She was cuffed. Don't worry, this didn't happen. Less than two months later, she was found guilty, sent to a women's prison. Fast forward about six months where I saw her again. Turns out she was pregnant when she was arrested and had just given birth when I saw her again at the hospital, this time to place her newborn baby in state custody. She was cuffed to the hospital bed with essentially a taser bracelet around her ankle. Saw her again at the juvenile court hearing for this child, where she went off in court blaming me for her children entering foster care. By the end of everything, she didn't even try to claim her innocence anymore, had continued saying she was innocent after found guilty. A few years back, her brother was also convicted of multiple murders here. The local paper did like a four-page spread on this family and their criminal history, talking about the criminal gene and the killer gene because of the vast familial history of related violent crimes. Just crazy. 